out here in my garden. This time of year, I like to get out and see how the new plants are coming up. It's such a wonderful day today, and I was just out taking a look at my garden. Uh, why don't you join me? Let's take a look, quick look around. This time of year, I like to take a look at my plants and see how they're, how they're faring. Basically, one of the worst things a gardener can find is some sort of a diseased plant this time of year because it takes forever to clear it up or gnats or mites or something of that sort. But right now, everything's looking pretty good here in my garden. Um, however, as I think about how much effort we put into keeping our gardens clear of disease, I'm reminded that there is a disease that affects plants that probably also transform the way we think, think about life in general. And that's gonna be the subject today. So I'm gonna go on downstairs, meet you down there, and we'll continue from here. Well, here we go, starting the second week. I hope you guys did like I did and got, out, uh, got out outside over the weekend, got some sun, enjoyed yourself a little bit. I know in these stressful times, being outside and getting some sun is good for you. So I hope you did. Um, so as I said, uh, we're, we're going to be talking about this amazing thing that this plant disease actually changed our understanding of what life is. It was the, it's, it's an amazing story and, and, and we'll get started on it. And I, I can't overemphasize how amazing this plant disease is to, to our understanding. So recall where we left off. We left off in the late 19th century, uh, knowing that the bacteria that caused cholera had been identified. It could be seen with a microscope, it could be grown, and it could be filtered out of the water so you could remove it. So we had a structure, property, performance type relationship where we could actually do this. Um, now, with that background, the scientists across the world were trying to identify other bacteria. They said, hey, you know, if this one causes disease, let's find others. Let's see if we can filter those. Let's see if we can identify them. Let's can see what's going on. And the disease that will figure prominently in, in the story that I've got for you today is the one I've already talked about. It was a plant disease. Uh, and the plant disease caused leaves on various kinds of plants to model and take on a kind of mosaic type pattern before they would die. And the disease was particularly prevalent on tobacco. And because tobacco was a very important cash crop, both in the United States and at that time at the turn around the 1900s, was also a very important cash crop in parts of Europe, uh, a lot of people turned their attention to this and said, oh my goodness, Maybe we, can, maybe we can get at this, maybe we can get at the bacteria that causes this uh, tobacco mosaic disease, also called TMD. So maybe we can figure out what's going on there. Um, now, what these researchers had learned is the following. If you take a leaf that was infected and just rubbed it on an uninfected plant, suddenly that, infected, that uninfected plant would develop the disease, the modeling. They also learned that it didn't just have to be the leaf. All you had to do was squeeze the sap. So you squeeze the sap out of an infected leaf, and then you touch a little drop of that sap to, a, to an uninfected plant, and it became infected. So the idea was, knowing this, uh, Martin Bjarnik filtered the sap he took the sap out of an infected plant and filtered it through the finest filters available, assuming that the bacteria would be removed and the sap would no longer be infectious. But to his surprise, when the healthy leaf was inoculated with the filtered sap, the leaf caught the tobacco mosaic uh, disease. And in an 1898 paper, he argued that the disease was caused by what he called contagium vivivium fluidium, that is, a contagious living fluid, which could pass through the pores of a filter. Now, I did, he did a number of experiments. I'm not going to go into all of them, but he concluded, and backed up by, by all these incredible ex, uh, experiments that he did, that this stuff was very, very small, and, and actually, he didn't like the idea of it being small. He liked it, the idea of it being a fluid that could kind of squeeze through places. So, he found that even when the leaves were dried, so he took the infected leaves, this was incredible, he took the infected leaves and he dried them 
And then he let them sit around for a long period of time. So they're just these desiccated things for months at a time. And there's no apparent food source. These things are just dead leaves. And then he took the dead leaves and, and rubbed them against the, the existing, existing leaves and lo and behold, but, but growing leaves. He rubbed them against growing leaves and lo and behold, they became infectious. So whatever this infectious agent was, this, this contagious living fluid, it, it just could sit around and have an, an, apparently an infinite shelf life or a very long shelf life. Didn't need to be eating anything. So this is totally different than a bacterium. Now, he also decided that what this did is the, the contagion needed, the contagious agent needed to be in a living cell in order to reproduce. So he did experiments to confirm that. And he said, oh my God, this needs to be in a living cell to reproduce. This set of properties is very different from those of a bacteria. So he named the mysterious agent a virus. Of course, the name that is stuck with it to this day. He did that in order to differentiate it from a bacteria. The virus that caused uh, tobacco mosaic disease became the to tobacco mosaic virus or TMV. So to summarize at this point where we are is they had discovered there was this virus that was too small to be seen, couldn't be seen with an optical microscope no matter how hard you looked. It couldn't be filtered and these other extreme methods he, he, he took to filter it couldn't be filtered by any of these, not only by passing it through these, these larger uh, filters, but he couldn't get it through any of the other kinds of filters he tried to use. It could be stored and remain infectious, and it required a host to reproduce. So this is where things are. Now, we know today that a virus is nothing more than a protein shell. It's basically a protective protein around a strand of nucleic acid, either RNA or DNA, that is our genetic material. The virus infects a host by abandoning its protein shell. This is nothing more than there for protection. So it abandons its protein shell and injects this little strand of RNA or DNA into a healthy host cell. Now, once there, that little strand of RNA basically hijacks the reproductive machinery of the cell, the healthy cell, and uses it to make more viruses, which eventually weaken or kill the cell and allow for these new viruses now to be released from the cell and go off and infect more healthy cells. So it's much like sneaking into a construction site and replacing the blueprints for the construction site with a set of totally different, totally different blueprints for a different structure entirely. Now the workmen come to work and they go about their job and they're following the blueprints and they make an entirely different structure. And that's basically what a virus does. It just says, hey, I'm going to hijack your workers to make what I want you to make. And they end up making more viruses. Okay. So the interesting thing, and this will come, this will come up on our lecture on Wednesday, without the reproductive machinery of the host cell, a virus is just a big inanimate molecule that just sits around waiting for a host. It's like, oh, over there is a set of blueprints. That set of blueprints doesn't do anything unless workmen come and build that. And those workmen, well, they all reside in the host cell. So just sits there waiting, stored on a shelf, can go wherever you want it. It'll just sit there and wait until it finds a host cell. Once in the host cell, now it reproduces. Now it begins to reproduce itself by swapping out the blueprints. So that was the state of the world in the early 1900s. This is 1900. And we know there are bacteria which could be seen and removed and filtered. <coughs> and there were viruses that we could not see and we knew nothing about their structure. So there's nothing we can do about these that puts us almost right back where we were before. If we can't see them or do anything with them, how, how do we know where they are? How do we do something? How do we understand them? How do we study them? So that's, that's the nature of the problem. So the world was totally on hold. Here we knew there were these viruses that couldn't be seen, but we had no way to get at them, no way to look for them, no way to see them. Then in 1913, the scientist Max von Laue 
proposed that x-rays might be used to see the structure of crystals. Now, you know x-rays because we've talked about these in class. Uh, x-rays are generated when you peel scotch tape. We talked about that in class. But also at this time, x-rays were made by bombarding a piece of copper, for instance, with, with electrons moving at very high speeds and emitted x-rays. And now the x-rays could be used to basically image crystals. Now, but not only proposed a technique, but this guy, William Bragg, just seized on the idea and set up an experiment. And he was the first person to be able to determine the structure of the first crystal. And when I say determine the structure, he could look at like sodium chloride and he could say, here's a sodium atom and here's how big it is. And here's a chlorine atom and here's how big it is. And here's the crystal structure. We've talked about crystal structures and here's how they're arranged. And he gave birth to the field known as X-ray crystallography, using X-rays to study crystals. And it's still one of the most used methods today to understand structure. Whoa. But it can only be used to study crystals. The reason is because we can kind of superimpose one pattern after another and we get a conglomerate. So rather than work at the whole thing, we work at a, uh, we look at a substitute, at a superposition of a whole bunch of these different things. And that's how we can use it to, to look at crystals instead of just one atom. So suddenly the world had a way to see atoms, providing they were in a crystalline form. So over 10 to 15 years that followed, which takes us from about 1925 to 1930, scientists were busy running around trying to crystallize everything. So lots of things are easy to crystallize. You can take water, you can crystallize water, you freeze it, right? You can crystallize water, you can, you can crystallize almost any liquid. So you crystallize a lot of things, but there were a lot of things that couldn't be crystallized. And there's a lot of stuff that already came crystallized. For instance, in the 1920s, it was then that we learned that most common metals come in the three forms you guys know as BCC, FCC, and HCP. Uh, and then people were crystallizing other things. They crystallized benzene, they crystallized all sorts of things. And now the first time we're beginning to see the atoms, we can see where they are and how they're arranged and what's going on in these crystalline stars. Now, at about the same time, proteins were being crystallized. Now, crystallizing proteins, proteins are big molecules. They're great, huge pro, uh, molecules, but they can be crystallized too. All that is, is a, is a bigger motif set on one of the typical lattices. Like, oh, I've got a, this protein, I'm gonna put it here on this BCC lattice, and I'm gonna put this other one here, and this other one here. And so they began to crystallize proteins and look at them in X-ray crystal, using X-ray crystallography and came to the conclusion, oh, I can see how big this protein is, what its weight is, what its mass is. I can actually pick out where some of the atoms are. Uh, as our methods improve, they can pick out all the atoms. But whew, now, what do you suppose people are doing? They go, oh, if I can look at proteins, can I look at the tobacco mosaic virus? Can I crystallize tobacco mosaic virus and see what it looks like? Is that the way to get to the structure? And that is the way to get to the structure. And we'll talk about the person who did it and what they discovered on Wednesday. So I'll see you then. And we'll pick up now with lecture in just a moment. Bye.